It's my privilege this morning to introduce our speaker. He is recently retired from Orangeburg Baptist Church in Modesto. He, his name is Stuart McNary, and he is a friend of Aaron's, and they apparently, they walk together most days, and they uh, break bread together with a group of men in the Modesto area each month. So um, it's great to have you with us. We thank, thank you. you for coming and sharing God's word with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Man. I really shouldn't say this, but I won't be at the pajama party. <laughs> because my pajamas only have one button. It is good to be with you. Am I turned on, Andrew? Am I okay? That's super. I hope you can hear me, because I can hear the laughter there in the back. Good morning to you all. I'm glad to be here. And for those of you online, I can't see you. But I've got a magic mirror here, and I can see John. And I can see Elaine. And I can see you. I don't come from around here, by the way. John chapter 20 is the passage that I've been given, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, that is John, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the team. Both were running, but the other disciple, that is John, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and he believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Last week, if you were here, I trust I'm right when I say this, or at least in chap when you were doing chapter 19, you will have heard Jesus cry out with a great triumphant voice, It is finished. Yet, he didn't mean that everything connected with his life ministry and mission was finished. Doubtless, his suffering and sacrificial death for sin was most certainly finished. His obedience to the perfect will of the Father had all been accomplished. Yet there was still something lacking. Still something that had yet to happen so that Scripture may be fulfilled. And what was that? It was the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus. For John and the other gospel writers... Nothing could be more disastrous than to consider the cross of Christ in isolation from the resurrection. Think of it. What would it mean? I want you to know that I sleep in my bed every night in peace. Because I know that the Lord Jesus not only took my sins and suffered for them and died death in my place, but that he rose from the dead. And my faith is not a leap in the dark. It's grounded in all that Jesus has done. And God put his imprimatur on the Lord Jesus and his work. When let's remember, 
God raised him from the dead. He was well pleased with his son and what he had done. The resurrection, in fact, was the very, the very fact upon which the faith and the testimony of the first Christians was based. And it was upon the resurrection, and because of the resurrection, that their behavior was transformed. If you like, the resurrection was God's imprimatur, proving that he was satisfied with all that Jesus had done. And it was the guarantee, not my guarantee, but God's guarantee, that trusting the Lord Jesus is not taking a risk. It's a sure thing. It's a sure thing that we can take to the bank. Thanks be to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we worship this morning. The resurrection proved that Jesus was not only the Messiah, but he was the Son of God he claimed to be. Now that's important because the resurrection is non-negotiable to faith and Christianity. And I'm going to ask the folks to put up the a text, the scripture from Luke chapter 24. Oh dear, I'm a silly Billy. Not just yet. Hold off for a moment. I'll tell you what it is when you're down in Hillmar and you smell that wonderful smell that comes from the fields. It can affect your thinking somewhat. I think you know what I mean. But Paul crystallizes the importance of the resurrection in Corinthians chapter 15. I don't want you to put this on the screen. I'm going to quote it. More than that, he said, we are found to be false witnesses. If Christ has not been raised, then our, all this stuff this morning is useless. And so is your faith. Because more than that, if we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for what we have testified about God that he has raised from the dead, if Jesus hasn't been raised, then your faith and my faith is futile. And we are still in our sins. That is how crucial the resurrection is to faith and to Christianity. Now, I wish I was here next Sunday, because chapter 21 to 10, you know, isn't as kind of fireworky as the next number of verses, because next Sunday, the one who follows me will have the joy of reporting on the actual personal post-resurrection appearance of, of Jesus, when the cherry goes on top of the cake. This morning, I'm left with the empty tomb, which actually assumes the resurrection. There are three witnesses to the empty tomb. Mary, Ma I didn't know you up there. Good morning to you too. It's nice to see you. And over there as well. One of the things that I noticed when I came in here this morning, that this was the land of giants. Because everybody I met was six foot four, six foot six, and six feet eight. And coming from the land of leprechauns, I felt very underwhelmed. Mary was the first witness introduced by John. And wonderfully, she was also the first to later see the risen Jesus in person. Now, if you know your Gospels and you've been reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll realize that they tell us that Mary came with a group of other wonderful Christian ladies. Mary herself intimates that in the second verse of chapter 20, because you will notice that she says that we, we, the first person plural, but John is writing from his perspective, and he's wanting to highlight only Mary. 
And it's worth noting that when Mary went to the tomb, think about this. Someone who had had such a wonderful experience of Jesus casting out seven demons. She had absolutely, having known him all that time, given of her finances to help support his ministry. She had absolutely no expectation of finding the tomb empty. Just think about it. You know, you think, my goodness me, if I'd known Jesus for three years and walked with him and talked with him and heard all of his stuff, man, I'd be a super saint. I'd believe anything. I'd be ready to take on the world. Not so. She was going to finish the job that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had begun when they first laid Jesus in that tomb. John mentions that Mary set off when it was still dark. And that actually is a technical term for the fourth watch, which is between the hours of 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Whatever time in that little opening, it was very early in the morning. And upon her arrival at the tomb, she saw that the stone had been rolled back. Now, the stone wasn't, you know, a little rock or pebble that you find on the ground. We're really talking about a huge, round, wheel-shaped rock that was in a groove. And I'm telling you what, a big fella like me couldn't even roll that stone back. And so when Mary saw that the stone had been ruled, rolled back, her immediate conclusion was that someone must have removed the body of Jesus and its whereabouts were unknown. And this was really perplexing and disturbing. And so she sets off in great distress to remember and to remind and to tell Peter and John what she had found. And of course, when they heard it, they were just as distressed and they immediately set off to get to the tomb as quickly as possible. Now, we read that John got there first. I don't know if he was in better athletic shape than Peter, but I think it was because he was obviously a younger man. And when he got to the tomb, he didn't go in. He simply bent over and peeked in. And I think the reason for that, I can't be sure of this, of course, but even after his denying Christ the way that he did, amazingly, Peter was still recognized as the leader. And John is deferring to his leadership, which shows you in some ways the difference between Peter and John in their personalities and character. But Peter, as he comes up huffing and puffing, he doesn't stand and wait for a moment to catch his breath. He goes right in there. And I imagine them looking around, searching that dimly lit tomb for clues as to what has happened. Anything, anything at all that would help them figure out what happened to the body of Jesus. Now here's something to notice that we can actually, I trust, relate to in our own lives. Note, they both saw the same things. The grave clothes were still there. The face covering folded up in a place by itself was there. And Mary's conclusion had been that someone had taken the body. But when Peter and John get to the tomb and they peek inside, and indeed Peter goes right in, they thought the evidence pointed in a different direction. But the amazing thing is they didn't know which direction yet for if someone obviously i mean think about it you know if you go to an undertaker today and you went to the viewing and the body was gone you know but you saw that the dead person's clothes nicely folded up you know by the side of the casket you'd think to yourself man if they wanted to steal the body why did they take the trouble to take off that guy or gal's clothes and carry them away you just pick it up and go you know, grave clothes and all. 
I don't know why you're laughing. <laughs> However, there is a very interesting difference here between John and Peter. In verse 5, you read the word, at least in my New International Version, I'm not sure what it is in the one that you tarry, but I can assure you that the Greek tenses mean the same. But in verse 5, the word translated looked in indicates a brief and fleeting glance. In verse 6, the word translated in English, the verb see, indicates a more intense gaze. But in verse 8, the word translated see indicates to see with understanding. There is a difference. And there's a very interesting difference. An interesting difference between John and Peter here. Both saw the same scene. But Peter was a little slow. John seeing the grave clothes and that head uh, napkin nicely folded up. In that moment in time, a penny dropped in John's mind. And John believed. John believed. Now, when I read that years ago, it bothered me. I thought to myself, didn't both he and Peter already believe? Didn't they already believe in the Lord Jesus? Hadn't they been following him for years? And of course, indeed, they had. But now John believes. Now, to my mind, that must mean in that moment, John came to believe in the resurrection. Yes, he did believe in Jesus. But obviously, both he and Peter, their minds were darkened and blinded to the fact that Jesus had to rise from the dead. But in seeing the scene, John believed. Not that he believed for the first time in Jesus. He believed in the resurrection. He believed that Jesus wasn't there because he had risen from the dead. <laughs> Bless his name. But why? Why did he believe? Were the empty tomb and the grave clothes and the folded face cloth enough to convince him? Was the resurrection now proven to him by these things, you know, beyond a doubt? And the answer is no. No, it wasn't what he saw, the side of things. John explains to us in verse 9 the reason. Because up to this moment, are you getting this? You look very quiet. They didn't understand. They didn't understand. They were thick as champ. They didn't understand from the scriptures that he must rise from the dead. The thing that made John believe in the resurrection at that moment was not the experience of the empty tomb alone, but those experiences that were understood in the light of Scripture. I tell you, I'm not really interested in people's experiences. I've been a pastor for 48 years, and I've heard people relate their experiences, and quite honestly, half of them I'll give a little bit of weight to, the other half I didn't believe, to be quite honest with you. If you're depending on someone's experiences, if they tell you, man, I, I saw Jesus, you know, I was in heaven and I died and came back again and all this kind of stuff, that, that, that doesn't phase with me. And I, I'm sorry if that offends you. But that's why I read the Bible, because I want to know what's true. I want to be able to sift, you know, between what's people's experience. I've met some crazy people over the years. What does it mean when we say that Christ lived and died and rose again in accordance with the Scriptures? What does that mean? Let me tell you what it means. It means the life and death and resurrection of Christ were not random. 
nor were they spontaneous events. They were fulfillments of the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Now, my good friends, can we have that scripture from Luke 24? Luke 24 and verse 25. There we go. Let's have it now. He said to them, these are the guys in the road to a mess. Remember, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Give us a bit more. Did not the message have to, that, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Give us more. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scripture con revealing concerning himself. That's what it's all about. Now, don't get too excited. I'd like to finish with a few practical observations. Mary Magdalene was obviously a wonderful woman. Don't believe everything you heard about her. Read the Bible and, and, and get the first-hand knowledge. Her love for the Lord Jesus is deep and it's striking. Now, that shouldn't be a surprise because Jesus had done something for Mary Magdalene that no one else could ever do. Luke tells us in chapter 8 that he had cast seven demons from her. And she could never forget. I mean, if you had seven demons cast out from you, do you think it would kind of evade your memory somewhat? I'll tell you what, you'd never forget it. And I want you to know that Mary was a devil woman. She was a demon woman. And whatever that meant. But I'll tell you what, before Jesus met her when she had seven demons living in her, she wouldn't have been the kind of person you'd want to take out for lunch. Mary had sinned much. Had sinned much. And she had been forgiven. And because of that, she had loved much. And love motivated her response. You see me standing here. I'm like a relic, aren't I? From the Middle Ages. I watched one of the videos from a couple of weeks ago and I saw you all, you know. And my wife said to me, Stuart, you're not going to wear that suit, are you? And I said, well, I've worn it all my life. I'm not going to change now. Oh, you're silly. I said, well, silly as I may be, it doesn't matter what you wear. You know, as long as you're covered, God doesn't mind, you know. But this wonderful conversion of Mary Magdalene that Jesus has brought about, that has changed her life, that it issued out in love and service. And all the more because she was a female, because she was a woman. In an era when men were all there was and women were an add-on, yet this woman, and I want to say, like so many other women throughout Scripture, was absolutely foundational to the gospel story. But it makes me wonder at times, does it not make you wonder at times, when you read about Mary Magdalene and, and other Bible characters who were real historical figures, how our hearts are. For Jesus. I've only been here for, you know, an hour or so. And it's been amazing to me to see how many people in the church seem to be devoted to serving. And I saw the bell ringers in the choir and the dudes up there in the media center. I thought to myself, man alive, these guys, they're really at it. 
And I talked to some people, and they were, oh, what do you do? Uh, I, well, I work with the youth. Oh, great. I work with the kids, and sometimes I work with, oh, really? I was impressed. But yet it can be so depressing that in our churches, among many, there is little practical devotion. Why is it we may work so little and give so little and say so little to make much of our Lord Jesus Christ? Let me tell you why I think it is. I think it may be that we have such a low sense of our own sinfulness. I think we think we're better than what we are. I think when we look in the mirror, we say, man, what a fine, handsome chap I am. Or you may say, man, what a crazily beautiful woman I am. But yet, you know, I know this about myself. You speak for yourself. I know my heart. And if you want to know more about it, don't ask me. Ask my wife. We have such a low sense of how sinful that we are and what Jesus has done for us at such a cost. Do we remember what it was like to be without hope and without God? If you're here this morning and you thought you were never like that, you need to have a chat with me later. Do we remember what it was like to be caught up in sin and to be covered in shame and guilt? You say, I've never been like that. I'm not in a hurry away. Take a few minutes with me later. Perhaps you say, well, I never felt like that. Well, then perhaps you came to faith at an early age and avoided much of what can be such a temptation later. Mary realized that Jesus had done something for her that she couldn't do for herself, nor could anyone else in the world do for her. Something life-saving and so life-transforming. Let me tell you, I don't have any doubt that it was that which spurred her devotion and service. Oh dear. You know, sometimes I've been preaching and people do that. It never bothers me. Sometimes they'll go, I know I'm still with them. But when they do this, <laughs> you know, I, I know it's time to stop. But number two, let's get away from Mary. Even at this stage, it's amazing how much ignorance even the closest companions of Jesus had. John tells us they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead, verse 9. How incredible. How incredible that seems. For nearly three long years, these two leading men had heard the Lord Jesus speak of his resurrection as a fact, and yet they never took it in. Again and again, Jesus had stated the truth of his messiahship and the fact that he had to rise from the dead, but they never understood it seems incredible. But how often did we hear the story of Jesus? You know, I'm not a natural Baptist. I started off as an Anglican, an Irish Anglican. And every Christmas and Easter, it was Jesus was presented to us. His gospel, his life, his person. And every time we recited the creeds and sang the hymns, and the God's honest truth. Yet we never truly embraced the true meaning, nor did we, nor I certainly did not practically appropriate what I was hearing. And it only goes to show how true grace and not heard knowledge is so essential. And having said that, I want to put on record here how grateful I am for the church of my upbringing in Ireland because they taught me so much and so much of it I actually didn't understand at the time 
but when my eyes were opened, I realized it wasn't their fault. It was mine. Thank God. We are in the hands of a merciful, compassionate Savior and the amazing Holy Spirit who are so patient with us. And thankfully, to be a true Christian doesn't mean we know and understand everything. Of course, there are things we must know. We must know our own sinfulness and our guilt. We, we must know the saving life and work of the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. We need to know the necessity of repentance and faith. Yet thanks be to God, there are things we may never know and understand in this life. Yet Jesus is able to empathize. Do you like that word, empathize? Oh, I love it. To empathize with our weakness and graciously nurture us along and use us to his glory all along the way. Thanks be to God. Now, I've got to give a cue. One last thing. I'm not prepared to take a leap in the dark. I may be green, but I'm not cabbage looking. I'm not prepared to take a leap in the dark for anyone when it comes to my salvation. Christian faith is an intelligent faith. Our faith in Jesus and his resurrection is grounded in solid evidence. I have to say this, if the empty tomb and the folded napkin were the only evidence for the resurrection, I want to tell you straight, speaking for myself, I would find it pretty thin. And I don't believe I would be convinced. But thanks be to God, John will tell us more in due course, just as Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. For when all is said and done, Jesus isn't seen just by one, but by hundreds. Not only is he seen, but he's touched, he's felt. Here, stick your finger in there. He even cooks breakfast. Real life, personal appearances that went on for 40 days until Jesus ascends to heaven. Jesus' resurrection is the guarantee that he, not me, not you, that he has done everything to meet God's expectations and there's no risk to trusting him. And it was for this very reason that God raised him from the dead so that you, like me, can go to bed this evening and sleep in peace. Look, I don't care if the roof falls in. I don't care if a herd of galloping turkeys from Hilmar run across my bed and trample me to death. Because everything's going to be all right. Thanks be to Jesus Christ, our Savior, the one and only Savior. Oh, man. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Put that in your pipe. And smoke it. And now I'm going to invite the worship team to come up and help us worship some more. Thank you, Stuart.